Well, if you want to celebrate a great victory, uh, we did it last week. All right? That's what Easter is about, celebrating the fact that God is victorious, Christ is victorious over the grave. He's conquered sin and death. And if you've been in this Joshua series with us, you perhaps recognize the end of Joshua 6. That's exactly where we were, celebrating the Lord's faithful presence to conquer the enemies of his people, and it's unequivocal. He's in charge. He grants victory. And so we would expect the fact that he's promised his people victory after victory after victory to mean that this dominance of the most fortified city in the ancient world, Jericho, would be the initial ball to get rolling, and then the momentum would just stack on top of itself. They're unstoppable now, it would appear, even from the first victory. And that's why it might be a little strange to us that by the time we get to Joshua 7, there's not another victory that comes in quick succession. Matter of fact, we're not addressing a victory at all. We're addressing the most pinpoint need that we have for God to supply a victory, our own sin, and the devastating effects of it. And that's exactly what Joshua chapter 7 details. And so if we look at the effects of sin, there's several elements that we'll try to draw out in the brief time we have together. But if we look at what sin does to us as a people and as individual people, the first thing that's evident from Joshua 7 is that sin harms you and the people around you. So first of all, sin harms you And those around you, let's read just the first 12 verses of Joshua chapter 7. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. You'll recall they were supposed to go into Jericho, into all the Canaanite lands, and everything that's there was devoted to destruction. So all these things and all these people have one purpose, to be destroyed, so that you can go in and take the land and receive the promise But they broke faith. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack I. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan O Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth? And what will you do for your great name? And the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. And I will be with you no more unless... You destroy the devoted things from among you. 
they have sinned. They are now in the crosshairs of destruction. Not he, they. Achan is identified ultimately, and as this is recorded in Josh, we've already been told that's who is culpable chiefly. But if you'll notice, God's decision to address rebellion is on everyone. Because as a part of God's people, what you and I do, whether in godly obedience to the grace and mercy of the Lord, turning toward godly obedience in repentance and belief, or disobeying him and stiffening our necks and refusing to do what he's very clearly told us to do, you and I take all of us down with us when we make those decisions. Or we encourage one another to come toward him in faith and hope and joy. But we're in this together. We are a hyper-independent, privatized culture. And it's awful, frankly. It makes us believe lies like, you can't tell me anything, that's my business. That's a lie. We all affect each other all the time. Just look in the eyes of your family members sometime when you've let them down or disappointed them or just outright not been there for them. It affects the people around you if you act in cherishing and joy or if you act in sullenness and refusal to move toward them in love. That's no less true, actually all the more true among the people of God. How we act toward God affects all of us. It's interesting that he thinks his sin is hidden. You'll see that in a moment, that he's concealed it. He's done it, but no one else has done it, just him. And he's going to conceal it in his dwelling, his tent. And so at the end of the day, the emphasis is on what he's done. But God turns it outward and said, it's on the issue of covenant fidelity, the faithfulness of my people I was very clear on how you were going to go in and have victory in the land. Inhabit this land full of blessing. And that's the thick irony here. You will be blessed. I will grant you prosperity, not in the sense of individual wealth, but in the sense of you will flourish and have joy. And what does Achan do? Now I'm going to short circuit this. There's got to be a shortcut to this. I'll take the blessing now. I'll take the prosperity now. I'll take the security now for myself. And what's interesting is when they are struck down and they are defeated, verse 5, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Whose hearts melt? The Canaanites' hearts have melted, remember? Rahab says, my people's hearts have melted before you. The Israelites have become, in essence, the Canaanites in this moment. You are the ones that were supposed to go in and destroy, overtake everything that was in opposition to the Lord, not turn around and stand in opposition to the Lord in rebellion. But that's what has happened. In Star Wars speak, you've become the very thing you swore to destroy. You've turned your face against the Lord instead of looking and seeking his face so that he would give you everything he's promised because he's present with you. That's what sin is. Sin is something that those of you in the room who choose to be more archaic and prudish think are bad things that you do. Sin is when I and you rebel against the holy God and say, you know what? I don't need you. I'm my own God. And that's called idolatry. And that's exactly what Achan has done. And that's exactly what the people now are drawn into, being accused of, and rightly so. So the stakes are very high here. When I talk about harm, this isn't just as if, if I choose to drink too much and become inebriated, I might wreck a car or cause someone to get injured, or I might lash out at my family. 
Those are horrible things that could occur. We're talking about the repercussions of this and how they affect everyone around. If I choose to fudge a little bit on my taxes, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal in part is it demonstrates that you don't care about integrity or honesty. And what that will do to you over time, especially if you've been doing it for years, is that dishonesty will bleed in all kinds of other places. Incidental conversation you have, even with the people you cherish the most in your life. It doesn't stay contained. It affects everyone around us when we make decisions like the one Achan has made here. When you look at what he's done, I mean, the precise sin, if we want to get right down to it, is covetousness. Right? I mean, that's the violation of the Tenth Commandment. What does he do? He's going to say in a minute, listen, we were there, I saw the cloak, I saw the coins, I saw everything that was there, and at the end of the day, I, I took it and I hid it, because who wouldn't, right? I mean, again, back to the tax, taxes are on the brain, right? So, it's tax season. I walk in and I see this, and nobody's taking it, and it's just going to get burned up anyway. Man, I, I just, I'm going to take it and hide it. I'm going to save it for a rainy day. And he has no idea the rains and storms that are coming because he took it. It's interesting that Joshua cries out. And who does he sound like now? He sounds like his forefathers wandering in the wilderness. Oh, God. Why did you bring us across the Jordan? It would be so much better if we could just be back in Egypt. Excuse me. Across the Jordan. It's almost exactly parallel language. The same idea that they uttered again and again, murmuring against God in the wilderness. It'd been better if you would have withheld your promise from us because now it's hard. And God instead is going to say, yes, they are turning their backs on their enemies. Yes, they've suffered defeat. But I've not backed away from my commitment to ensure that you know who I am because I'm life to you. And I've pledged that you would have life in me. But here's where we are, Joshua. Just to recount verse 12 again. You can't stand before your enemies. You turn your backs. You have become devoted for destruction. Their hearts are melting. They just want to go back across the Jordan, including their leader is asking that question. And at the end of the day, Here's the position you're in. You've chosen to rebel like the Canaanites. Now my anger is burning against you. And the key is verse 9. But God, you have promised in covenant faithfulness to be with your people. And what's going to happen is if this continues, our name will be cut off from the earth. We won't be a people anymore. We won't even exist. So God, not what are you going to do principally and ultimately to rescue us, but Joshua has the right concern in verse 9. God, what are you going to do for the sake of your name? You uphold your name. You bring glory to your name. That's why we're your people, because we know only hope and life and joy is found in you. You're the one true God. But if we're cut off, what will people wag their fingers and say about you? from among the nations? What will they claim in opposition to you? And so you can see that Achan has brought harm to himself. He's brought harm to the people. And he is dangerously close to impugning the reputation and character of Almighty God. That's the most serious, serious series of harm you could bring I've wounded myself, I've jeopardized myself, I've harmed the people I care about, and ultimately because of what I've done, people will question the person of God himself, unless God acts in a significant way to change this. And so we see that sin harms you and others, but secondly, it, it harms you and it harms others because it takes hold of you. Sin takes hold of you. Let's read verses 13 through 
21 together. The Lord's still speaking to Joshua. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes, and the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans, and the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households, and the household that the Lord takes shall come near man by man, and he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord. And because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. And so Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near, tribe by tribe. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought near the clans of Judah and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. And he brought near the clan of the Zerahites man by man. And Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household man by man. And Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them, and I took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. Achan got away with it, right? He had, to this point, gotten away with it. I don't know for what period of time they were hidden under his tent, but they had been hidden. And until the Lord narrows to the point of identifying who it is that took these things that were to be devoted for destruction, no one knew. Until it was very clear that Achan is there. I don't know how many of you love 80s movies I'm just the right age to have loved 80s movies. Completely impractical, but they make you excited, right? Red Dawn was one of my favorite 80s movies. Band of about seven high school students. Their high school mascot was the Wolverines. Take on the entire Cambodian and Russian army uh, and are pretty successful. And basically all they know how to use is a deer rifle when it starts. And before you know it, they're firing RPGs and all kinds of things. At one point, they're attacked in this fight during the winter, and they can't understand why they're attacked in such a precise way. They seem to know their location. And so then they neutralize all the threats, and they make their way down the line away from where they have been attacked from, and they locate by one of the bodies what seems to be something tied to a tracking beacon, it beep, 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 and they're going, what is this? And one of them starts walking with it, beep, 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 and they realize one of them has swallowed a tracking beacon so the enemy can be led right to them. And the hard thing that happens at that point is they realize that They have to kill this person. And at first, Jed, Patrick Swayze, the leader, he he can't bring himself to do it. And Robert, who's a little bit crazy, takes Daryl's life. Spoiler alert. The winnowing down effect with precision to know exactly who the culprit is, who's been a traitor to them, that's what all these division points of tribe to clan to household to man to man does. It identifies the threat. And then Joshua actually says, give praise to God, give glory to God. Tell me, don't hide this from me. It's not hidden, we're all looking at you now. Just confess it. And he confesses that he has 
coveted. It's interesting. What you realize and what I realize from reading this is he does get away with it in Jericho. He doesn't get away with it, period. You're getting away with it right now. If you're sinning in secret, whatever that is, you fill in the blank. It's not in secret. The eyes of the Lord search out all things throughout all space and all time. And he holds them in the palm of his hand. He sees everything that you are doing or failing to do. He sees everything that I'm doing or failing to do. He sees all of it. Nothing is hidden from him. It is interesting. The language that Achan uses is directly parallel to what you see in Genesis 3. The same verbs are used. Well, here's what happened. I saw the fruit, and it seemed to be good to eat, even though you had said in the day we eat the fruit of that tree, we'll surely die. And so I I took the fruit, and I, I did eat the fruit, and then I tried to hide from you. And be out of your sight, because I did it. It's the exact progression that Achan follows. And it's the exact progression you and I follow. We see something, an opportunity, a person, a situation, a relationship. That God's been very clear that this is death to you if you do this. This is going to erode my relationship with you. This is going to be counter to everything that's going to bring you contentment and joy. But I don't, I don't see it that way, God. So I take it and I try to satisfy myself with it. And then when guilt comes or conviction comes, if I'm hoping in Jesus, I just try to hide from it or push it away. I certainly conceal myself from the Lord by making sure I don't tell any of you and you don't tell me, right? And we think it's hidden, and it will just disappear and go away. But nothing's been hidden, and nothing's gonna disappear and go away. And that's what God is very clearly trying to indicate to them before he goes any further with them in these series of conquests, is that we are at a stopping point until you deal with this. Because what should have been devoted to destruction was not. And so now, the suspect to be devoted to destruction is you. Unless you deal with this. And there is not an alternative plan. This is it. This is the truth. And so if if you look at the nature of what sin has done in Achan's life, much like Eve's life, much like all of our lives... You look at Adam and Eve, we all experience death because of what they did. They are all about to experience the judgment of God because of what Achan did. Because of the way Achan went about it, it is so very similar to Eve, to Adam's situation. So taking us back to the very point where all this mess was started should also remind us of the mercy of the Lord at that point. Because sin does take hold unless someone else will reign over the sin. Paul's very clear in Romans 6. Great word pictures there. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. What does that mean? It means there's a throne that is in authority over your body. Your mind, heart, your soul. And on that throne is intended to reign the Lord God who seeks your good and hope and joy. And what sin wants to do, because sin isn't the things you do, that is the symptomatic output of it. Sin wants to dethrone the Lord and sit in authority over you. And so how does it do that, Romans 6? Well, it actually tinkers with your desires so you see something that you want. And when your desires turn on you, and turn on godly evil direction, they use the parts of your body against you to do things you know are not healthy and good and right for you. And so the nefarious tactic and strategy is to undo you from the inside out. It starts with your heart. 
That's why Jesus is so adamant in Matthew 5 and 6 to say, here's the deal. If you even look at a woman with the intent to start to lust after her, you've already committed adultery. Already. Why? Because I looked with the intent to do it. My heart is already there. And my heart is what's at stake here. Just like Achan's heart was at stake here and it drove him to action. So it takes hold of you if it's allowed to reign in your mortal body, in my mortal body. And so it harms us because it does take hold of us. And if the good news is not that good so far, it ultimately will destroy us. That's the bottom line. So that news is the worst news you can receive. That something's going to destroy you. How many of us have sat in doctor's offices and that's that's the news you get? They didn't use those words. They have bedside manner, right? But the diagnosis is as such and the prognosis is as such... It's a painfully silent moment, isn't it? When you sit with a loved one or you yourself get that news. I I mean, it's like time stops. Like you just, I feel about you, I just sit there. How, How can that be? And nobody questions the severity of that moment or that diagnosis and prognosis. But we question the severity of sin because really is it that bad? I mean, this is a little harsh. I mean, the Lord's identifying this one. His anger is burning against the people because of it. Doesn't he need to lighten up some? This is how heinous my sin is right now and yours too. This is actually how bad it is. That it will kill us. It will destroy us. What's interesting is when you read the remainder of the text, that's exactly what the Lord brings into light. Verse 22, so Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took these things out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel and they laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with them took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. And they burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. What do you have to do when you're under condemnation that's rightly Ours because we have sinned. It has taken hold of us. You, you see it and you get rid of it. You, you'll notice in this story, Achan did confess. It's very different than the Egyptian confession, by the way, just as a parallel. The Egyptians thought if, if bad things happen as a result of this, I just I need to confess some type of wrongdoing in their moral framework. But there's no culpability, like I haven't offended anyone really. Achan actually does say, I've, I've done this. I've done it against the Lord. Like he recognizes that. But the consequence for his sin is not undone. The consequence that all those that are connected with him suffer because of what he's done, that's not undone. It still takes place, it still occurs. And they carry it out. And they pile up stones on top of them. This is not a commemoration in the same sense as Joshua 4 when they've crossed the Jordan. There, they're told to construct this monument 
to remind them of the Lord's presence. They bury him and put the stones on top of him. Both, we're told, stand until this day, until the day this is written. So both stand as a reminder. One, the presence of God and covenant faithfulness. The other, a reminder of the fact that we damage and harm ourselves, the people around us, and allow sin to reign and rule over us. And in so doing, it will destroy us like it destroyed Achan. Don't forget that is the point to that pile of stones. And so, if this is the end of Achan, and yet the Lord's anger burns no more, I think there's several things that we can think through here. The first of all is, for all of our pointing the finger, outside of those who hope in Christ and outside of the church, I can't believe these people act like that. I can't believe these people vote that way. Whatever it is, we all have axes to grind. I have a ton of them, right? In my weak moments, I'm just frustrated at everything, right? (laughs) Everything that's ungodly, everything that's unrighteous, it gets on my nerves, right? I, I get that. I get that. Here's what's shocking in this passage. If you remember Rahab in chapter 2, She is among the people devoted to destruction, and she looks to the Lord and his people and says, I identify with you. Recognize me as one of you. Your God is the one true and living God, and rescue me to belong to you. She, in effect, becomes an Israelite. That's how she's treated. Achan goes in to Canaan, and instead of observing what the Lord has said and devoting to destruction, He becomes an object of destruction and brings everyone else in with him. He becomes a Canaanite, in essence. And when you and I choose to rebel against the character and the word of the Lord, we have become rebellious against God, as if we're his enemies, not his children by faith in his son. That's what we've done. And we are actively doing that when we slander one another. When we want what one another has and we long after it. When we impugn each other's reputation to somebody else because it seems to give us a leg up in another relationship. When we're dishonest with each other and those outside of those who know the Lord. But here is the beauty of the fact that Easter is not long forgotten The beauty of what Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane can be seen in light of what we see here. When he asks for the cup to pass from him, if there's any way possible, he's asking, Lord, I I know that your wrath has to be poured out on sin. You can't wink and nod at it. You're not going to act like it doesn't happen because you really are God. Yet not my will, but yours be done. So his submission to the will of the Father is evident again. And what does he do? He has the cup of God's wrath poured out on him. He drinks it to the very last drop of it and suffers it on behalf of the people. Why does that matter? Because the writer of Joshua is adamant. What tribe does Achan belong to? Judah. This is the prized tribe. This is the tribe out of which the Savior is going to come. And this man from the tribe of Judah, Achan, on behalf of his tribe and his people, brings them wrath and condemnation that they will all suffer. And ultimately, he suffers it on himself. Why? Because he's unrighteous, because he did sin. Because he was guilty of it. And there is a lion of the tribe of Judah who will come long after this occurs. And he will not come with unrighteousness, but pure and perfect righteousness. And he will live in absolute obedience and submission to the will of God on behalf, not just of his tribe, but of his people, 
all of those who will hope in him, and he will drink every drop. He will endure the wrath of God on the place of all those who hope in him that they would be sheltered in him by faith in the Lord's mercy forever and ever and ever. And that's exactly what Colossians 2 says if you lay it alongside Romans 6. Friends, your sin is not coming in to tinker with your life and make it harder. It's coming to end you. That's what it's coming to do. It's not playing games, but we play games with it many times. And the reason we know it's not playing games is because Jesus took the penalty that we deserve and by the Father's intention, nailed it to the cross. Defeating sin's ability to take root in your life and take hold. And 1 John 1, 9 is very clear. If we confess with our mouths, he will forgive us. So what should we do? We have to realize that what we do is actually sin. We have to call it that. It's not a, it's not a mistake. It's not a, a struggle. It's not, it's sin. Achan, who ultimately met his own condemnation here, he actually says it's sin. I did this. He admits it. He, he owns up to it. We have to own up to it. We have to actually confess it to God and say, this is sin, God. And Christ came not just to deliver me from the penalty of sin and death, which he did, but believer, brother and sister, came to deliver you from the power of sin. We don't go on sinning so that grace may abound. May that never be the case for us. So we confess daily, consistently, repeatedly, so that it might not affect our relationship with the Lord. And then we repent, and true repentance means I'm actually going to act in a way that counters the way I have acted, thought, intended. If I've wronged you by my sin, I confess to God, and I say it to you, and I commit to you I'm not going to do that again. And here's the beauty of that. That's the mercy and grace of the Lord. That pile of stones and aquar, and that word just means trouble, is to remind us of the trouble we bring on ourselves and each other, the harm we bring. The hold that sin can have on us and ultimately the hope that we can have. That we actually might have life by Christ's life who is alive forevermore. And we will be together with him So if you don't know Jesus today, know him today. Know him today. Believe, hope in him today. The beauty of this text, as awful as it is to look at, is that the theme is hope. God will continue with his people because they trust in him. And now they've been reminded a lack of trust and indifference to me, rebellion against me is not a minor thing. It will break all that you think you're doing to make progress, but he extends mercy. So let me pray for us and we'll respond together. God, we do thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you are merciful. We thank you in the face of our sin. And the incredible thought is that Christ bore your wrath, that he's granted life and joy and peace and hope in the place of sin and death. Thank you, Lord. And I pray, God, that as we look to you today, Whether we are believing and hoping in Jesus, we have been, and we certainly need to repent and and turn to you. God, I pray that we would do that. I pray if we need to hope in Christ for the first time today, that we would do that. Praise you, Lord, that you are merciful to us, sinners. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to pray with someone, respond, speak to someone, uh, several of us will be right down here if you'd like to come forward as we sing. Or even after the service is over, several of us are linger, we'll be around if you need to talk. But also, too, if you're believing and you just want to pray, pray. Confess your sin here. It's your sin where you are. Respond to the Lord, we pray, whatever he would call you to do.